Erev Tov in Rothpina. Good morning to our friends in Raleigh. Greetings to all of our friends around the world. For those of you celebrating the Jewish New Year, Shana Tova. Great to be back with you after a short break for the holidays uh, for us. My name is Wayne Firestone. I get very excited when I get to introduce to you uh, uh, people that know a thing or two about Israel and its neighborhood. And boy, have we got an expert uh, in line today. Before we begin and I introduce our guest for today, um, I want to, as we always do, begin with a little bit of a community building moment and ask for your book recommendations. We've got a really sharp uh, group of, of people on our calls. I love it when uh, people uh, share with one another tidbits. Sometimes it's recipes. Sometimes it's a, a, a great uh, fiction book. Sometimes it's a, a, a must read. Um, I'll throw out uh, for Israel culture lovers. I read over the holidays, Mati Friedman's book, Who by Fire. Uh, you don't have to love Leonard Cohen like I happen to love uh, his music, but even if you don't love him, it is a fascinating sort of insight into uh, the Yom Kippur War from a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, uh, there are some hidden uh, uh, unreleased manuscripts that are, are used in, in the book, and it really was a great read for me. So uh, let us know what you're reading. We'll uh, look for an opportunity to uh, uh, share that amongst yourselves. Um, and if you're ready for your next book, uh, we've got uh, uh, a few that uh, we could uh, recommend from our, 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 our guest today. It's a real privilege for me today to have Ambassador Itmar Rabinovich with us talking about his, uh, well, he's going to talk about a lot of things today. Let me introduce him first just by saying that he's Israel's former ambassador to the United States and chief negotiator with Syria in the 1990s. Uh, he is president of the Dan David Foundation. He's president emeritus and counselor to the Israel Institute. He's had visiting appointments at Princeton, Cornell, University of Pennsylvania, University of Toronto, Harvard, uh, a long association with NYU and the Brookings Institute, which I believe was the publisher of his latest book. That is his 12th book. Um, which we're going to start and talk with a little bit about uh, uh, today. But um, many of us old timers, some of us with uh, gray hair now, uh, remember him as a faculty member at Tel Aviv University. He's been a faculty member since 1971. I can tell you from uh, personal experience, he was uh, beloved by uh, students and faculty alike, went on to become the president of Tel Aviv University 1999 to 2007. And in somewhere in that span of time, uh, wrote uh, his uh, 12th book now. This one's called The Middle Eastern Maze. And uh, uh, word has it, he is uh, 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 he, he didn't stop there. He's uh, working on his 13th book. And if we have time, maybe we'll get into a little bit about that today. Professor Rabinovich, when you aren't writing and you aren't traveling, um, uh, what's keeping you up at night these days? What keeps me up uh, at night today is the domestic crisis in, in Israel. I think it's the worst we ever had because it's not just a strife over this or that. It's, uh, you know, we refer to the, sometimes they call it just judicial reform, uh, but it's a judicial coup. It's an attempt to, to seize the state and to transform the state by a radical messianic group to grab power. Uh, to eliminate most gatekeepers, uh, to weaken the Supreme Court, and uh, by doing that, to opening uh, the way for turning Israel into a halachic uh, state. Uh, it's pretty far-reaching. And even if it doesn't materialize literally, uh, it has already weakened the state. It is, uh, you know, Israel is a patchwork of uh, communities uh, held together by very thin ropes and it's very easy to disrupt and uh, they are disrupting so uh, uh, i would say it's an existential crisis for israel or challenge so, so for it, a moment for a moment um uh and i appreciate your 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 candidness and and uh uh reflection we many of us are are watching this from a distance and from um, our, our, our friends uh, who, who 
our, our experience this week in, week out, and have watched this uh, evolve. But we're not the only ones, the, the lovers, the Chobav of Zion of, 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 of Israel that are watching this show. Um, there are people who don't love Israel who are watching this show as well. And I'm, I'm curious um, if you could share a little bit about how the Arab world and Israel's neighbors and, and Israel's detractors, even beyond the Arab world, what are they seeing when they see street protests in Tel Aviv? Um, and the prospects of, of uh, continued strife domestically in Israel. Okay, the, the radical camp, the pro-Iranian camp, that's Iran, Hezbollah in, in, in Lebanon and Syria, and Tunisia and so forth, uh, they gloat. They think that uh, Israel is uh, bursting at the seams, that it may be the end of the Zionist uh, dream and, and entity, they say so. Um, that's one view. The other that you you see in the Arab world is actually one of appreciation. Arabs uh, have suffered for a long time from uh, absence of democracy. The Arab Spring uh, of about a decade ago was an, an, an attempt to bring democracy to the Arab world. It failed. And they see democracy at work. Yes, there is a, a government with autocratic tendencies, but there is a healthy civil society that rallied to the defense of uh, democracy. And, uh, you know, for uh, 40 weeks now, uh, every Saturday night, uh, dozens of thousands, sometimes more than 100,000 people demonstrate in Tel Aviv and in other places. It's pretty impressive. And some in the Arab world are really appreciative of this. Well, I know your perspective uh, on uh, the Arab world uh, is, is long and deep, both from personal experience and from your own research. Um, let's talk about the book a little bit and the, the, the scope of this uh, period of time, 1948 to 2022. Um, what are the major themes of, of, of the opportunities for peace that have, you know, I think we're at the 30 year anniversary of Oslo now. Uh, it feels very far uh, away, not only in time, but in, 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 in substance. What are the, are the themes that you feel, the, 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 the sort of thread lines that, that mark this period that, that you've written about? Yeah, so um, the Arab-Israeli relationship uh, was transformed over these years. I mean, it, it began with a, a very powerful, uh, a resentful rejection of, of Israel. The Arabs were defeated in 1948. It was very painful and humiliating, and they responded by trying to boycott uh, uh, the boycott Israel. Uh, Israel was not accepted. And the first breakthrough uh, came in 1979 with the signing of an Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. Then Jordan came uh, in uh, 1994. Now we have the Abraham Accords. Uh, we may have the uh, normalization with Saudi Arabia. Um, so things are things are changing. Um, first of all, time had its effect. Secondly, many Arabs became tired of the Arab-Israeli conflict, and in a way, also of the Palestinians. They have said, "We have given you uh, 70 years, 75 years of loyalty and support. We paid for it. Sometimes by losing people in war, and sometimes in other ways." Enough is enough. We now have to look after our own issues. We have Iran, we have uh, the jihadis. Uh, we need to, in the case of the uh, states in the Gulf, to transform our economy from oil and gas economy to a, to a different economy. Israel is a very good partner in all of this, and we want to normalize with, uh, with Israel. So this is a very important trend. At the same time, the Palestinian uh, issue persists. It persists first and foremost because of people. Uh, if you count the number of uh, Israelis and Arabs west of the Jordan uh, and you include the Gaza Strip, it's basically the same number, uh, almost an even number. Um, so uh, they are there. You cannot ignore that. And something needs to be done about the Palestinian issue. It will not go away. So this is uh, this is uh, persisting. 
uh, the role of the United States as Israel's uh, supporter, but also as a, a, as a peacemaker. The initial role of the Soviet Union as a troublemaker and uh, uh, receding later on, the role of China as a, a new power beginning to play a role on, on the scene and so forth and so forth. There were times when people used to float the idea uh, of uh, maybe not so long ago of, of Gaza first. Um, uh, and, but arguably some people think it, it's gonna be Gaza last in terms of uh, uh, peacemaking. Where, 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 are there, are there any positive developments that, that, that you can see or anything to build on from this period um, that, that doesn't yeah. seem to have a lot of happy headlines? Yeah, in theory, in theory, Gaza first could be a very good idea. It's, uh, there are no settlements in Gaza. It's, uh, it's a territory that is, you know, uh, free of uh, settlement. It has a, a shore, it has access to the sea. It has a sufficient number of people, and it could be the initial Palestinian state, and, uh, and the West Bank or parts of the West Bank would then be linked to it. There's only one problem, it's controlled by Hamas. <laughs> uh, Hamas, unlike the, the PLO, does not accept the idea of making peace with Israel, because in their fundamentalist Muslim view, a territory that used to be Muslim cannot be under alien rule and the Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel or in Palestine cannot be recognized. So Hamas is not a partner for peacemaking. And secondly, if you make a deal with Hamas, you end up destroying the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. So it's not a good idea for this time, but in theory, not a bad idea. Our you know, the one big headline um, uh, from, from the, the recent um, uh, uh, period, I guess the Abraham Accords um, is the kind of thing that um, happened maybe without uh, a high expectation that it could happen. Um, now that it's a reality and we see Israeli commerce in Dubai, and we see uh, trade and and tourism, and uh, a, a, you know a, a, a kind of normalization uh, that maybe even exceeds what we saw in Egypt after uh, the uh, the you know peace treaty. Or is this a outlier that this happened, or is there a possibility that there will be other breakthroughs that are sort of unforeseen just because of alignments that, that, that build at a particular time? Yeah, of course the big if is Saudi Arabia, I'll come to that in, uh, in a minute. Um, the, the Abraham, you know, Israel has had under the table relations with the uh, Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates and others for a long time under the uh, tables. Um, and at some point the Emiratis decided that they were willing to put it over the table. And there were three partners to this, the Emiratis, uh, the very effective ambassador in, uh, in Washington, uh, the um, Trump administration, uh, and the Israeli government. And they worked it out uh, to the benefit of uh, everybody. I was not a great fan of the uh, Trump administration and his foreign policy, but this is their one achievement, the, uh, the Abraham Accords, and they did use American assets for this. Not so much with the Emiratis, but let's say with Morocco to, to recognize, uh, to recognize uh, Moroccan sovereignty in the Sahara, um, you know, was something that it was an American diplomatic asset that Trump gave in order to uh, have them join the um, uh, the Abraham Accord. So uh, it was an unusual, uh, it was an unusual diplomacy, and it, it happened. It may have surprised people when it broke out, but actually it had been prepared uh, for a long time. And with Saudi Arabia too, it's it's been there for a while, uh, and now it's been expedited because President Biden very much wants it to to happen. He needs, uh, from his perspective, an American Saudi deal. He needs to patch up. Uh, with the Saudis to keep the Chinese away and the Iranians away. And, and uh, the Saudis have a very, a very high price tag for, for this. Uh, they want uh, what they call civilian nuclear, 
to be recognized, and they want Article 5, which is a, in, in, in fact a defense pact a la NATO with Saudi Arabia, not very easy to get it through Congress. Republicans are not likely to, to try to help Biden get a major achievement in an election year, and liberal Democrats uh, don't or dislike Saudi Arabia. And in the view of the White House, you need the Saudi-Israeli component in order to get the whole deal through Congress. So uh, uh, Biden softened his criticism of Netanyahu because he needs him as a partner. This may happen or may not. I think one of my, uh, you know, as a, a naive American college student coming to the Middle East and uh, uh, to Tel Aviv University, I remember uh, thinking that uh, good negotiators were um, uh, neutral. And then uh, uh, I took one of your colleagues' courses and read some of your works, uh, Sajia Tuval, about uh, American negotiation and, and his, his point about um, actually uh, a, a good mediator in the Middle East actually needs to have skin in the game and, 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 uh, um, and assert it. Um, can you characterize what you've seen over this period that you've covered in the book uh, about, let's start with American foreign policy. What, what have you seen in terms of um, America's willingness to put assets into resolution and, and where has it worked best and where has it, uh, where has it failed the worst? Okay. In the early days of the state, in immediately after the 48 war and during the 50s, the United States was not so friendly to Israel. He tried to end the Arab-Israeli conflict through mediation. Uh, none, none of these efforts worked out. The first American success came with Henry Kissinger at the end of the Yom Kippur War. This is when the peace process began that is still uh, unfolding. And he, uh, he understood uh, in his wisdom that uh, the United States has one big asset. It, it could show to the Arabs that it was only through Washington that they could regain the territories they lost in 67, not through Moscow. And he used it to the, uh, to the full. He brought Egypt from the Soviet camp to the American camp. That was the greatest diplomatic coup of, uh, uh, of the Cold War. And he began this peace process. He, by the way, did not believe that you could legislate a full uh, uh, or final settlement to the Arab-Israeli conflict. He thought that was not feasible, and he believed in the uh, in, uh, peace, uh, peace by peace, uh, peace, uh, um, peace process. Uh, partial agreements, building up confidence, gaining time, and so forth. But he started the, uh, the peace process. And then came somebody very different, President Carter, who um, found out that Menachem Begin, the Israeli Prime Minister, and Egypt's President Sadat wanted to talk to each other. That was not his own plan. He actually did not like it very much at the outset, but he understood that if Egypt and Israel wanted to talk peace, the US had to endorse it. And he went fully into the game. And Camp David happened. And Camp David would not have happened without the persona of, of Jimmy Carter, who could, who could be very uh, determined, sometimes manipulative, sometimes cunning, and made it happen. Um, and uh, deserves a lot of credit for uh, for that. You know, then uh, you had the Bush-Baker team that began the Madrid peace process after the Gulf War and, and built the, the peace process as we know it for, uh, uh, for many years. Uh, President Clinton, with his uh, very strong uh, personality um, that um, uh, invested a lot of effort uh, in in uh, in the peace uh, in the peace process, less so Bush and uh, and Obama, and then Trump. You know, Trump very much wanted to make an Israeli-Palestinian peace because he wanted the Nobel Prize, and he said, as the author the the author of the art of the deal, this is going to be the ultimate deal. I'm going to make it. Didn't say it, but meant it, and I'll get the Nobel Prize for it. That did not quite uh, uh, not quite happen. President Biden came into his presidency with a decision not to become involved in Arab-Israeli or Israeli-Palestinian affairs and ended up, because of what I said earlier, 
uh, being now in the midst of it. Well, you, you, you mentioned an interesting um, reality when this started in the Kissinger era, it was a Cold War, the Cold War ends. Um, Russia is preoccupied at the moment, but I am curious about China, if um, there's been any suggestion or interest uh, or what, chi how Chinese interests in the Middle East have manifest themselves if at all? They, they do very slowly and gradually. It began with just economic interest, interest in infrastructure and resources, but you can see the beginnings of uh, political diplomatic ambitions. They broke the deal between Saudi Arabia um, and uh, Iran, and they are now, they became interested in Syria. You know, Syria needs to be rebuilt after the civil war. The West is not willing to finance it. Maybe the Chinese uh, are interested in, of course, getting the, uh, the control of oil and other natural assets that are in Syria. I think this is the wave of the future. We'll see more and more political, diplomatic, and military presence and activity by the Chinese. And we might as well get into Iran. You, you referenced it there. Can you give us a, a, a broader perspective of, of uh, on Iran today? For a while, it was sort of the, the singular focus in terms of, not singular, but it, but it was a, a, a uh, there seemed to be a lot of uh, recognition um, over even a couple of administrations uh, about the challenge there. Has that diminished any, uh, this recent hostage deal that the United States uh, made with Iran? Um, I know these are, these are very difficult decisions for any government uh, to make when they're uh, uh, trying to release uh, captives, but do you see any signs of, of, of change or softening in, in Iran? Okay, yeah. let, let me, you asked for a broader perspective, let me try to, to frame it. Uh, maybe the biggest change in, in the politics of the Middle East in the last few decades has been the fact that Iran and Turkey have rejoined fully the Middle East. It may sound mm -hmm. a bit uh, strange. These are two Middle Eastern countries, but, and these are, these were the, the seats of two empires that uh, ruled large parts of the Middle East in earlier centuries. But in the 20th century, Turkey uh, was in a phase where it wanted to be a European country um, and looking to the West. And Iran was very much preoccupied with domestic problems and with fending off the Soviet pressure. So they were not fully manifest. Uh, after the Iranian revolution in 79, when the policy of the Islamic Republic was to export the Islamic Revolution to Middle Eastern countries. And after Erdogan came to power in, in Turkey, and after Turkey was rebuffed by the European uh, Union and uh, understood that it's not going to be accepted in Europe, decided to invest its interest in the Middle East. So you now have these two countries that have joined Middle Eastern politics fully. And these are not just two other countries. I mean, these are very large countries, at the right, around 90 million, strong, strong economies, sophisticated elites, strong military. And uh, if you look at it from an Arab point of view, very difficult to accept that the three strongest countries in the region are not Arab, there's Turkey, Iran, and Israel. Hmm. Uh, so it's a different Middle East in, uh, in that regard. Now, within that, uh, the uh, Iranian regime has still not gone through the revolutionary process. You know that revolutions tend to, uh, tend to go through cycles, begin with a, a revolutionary zeal and uh, turmoil, and eventually, at some point, they calm down and uh, a more sedate uh, period comes in. This has not happened in, uh, in Iran. The Ayatollahs, the, the clerics, and uh, a very large ruling establishment are there, and they continue to be uh, uh, to be radical. Uh, now, they also uh, are developing a nuclear weapon. Now, the idea that Iran uh, would be with a nuclear weapon, the combination of this kind of regime and nuclear weapon, is very difficult to digest by, first of all, by Israel, 
but now we know openly also by Saudi Arabia. I mean, the, the very interesting interview that the uh, Saudi crown prince, the de facto ruler, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, gave to Fox News about a week ago, he said, among other things, is that we, uh, we cannot accept the Saudis to have a nuclear weapon. If they have it, we, we, we will have it. So he now joined, it used to be for quite a few years, seemed like an exclusively Israeli crusade uh, against Iranian nuclear. The Saudis and other Arabs kept quiet. Now we have to be grateful to the Saudi Crown Prince for putting it on the table, telling the United States and the international community, if you let Iran become nuclear, we will become nuclear. Now, the, he didn't say it, but we know that if they end up being nuclear, so will Egypt and Turkey. Now, does the world wants to, to live with a fully nuclearized Middle East? I don't think so. So the road to Riada, will that be a, a, a train track? Will that be a, uh, a, a, an airpoint connection? Will that be some high-tech uh, company in, in Tel Aviv setting up, a, a, I don't know, a, a satellite office there? What, what, tell us a little about your thoughts on, on how, uh, you know, what are some scenarios in which there could be some gradual, uh, either below the table, on the table, um, uh, rapprochement, or, or, or uh, I guess it's just the beginning of, 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 of relations. Uh, what might that look like? You mean Saudi Arabia and Israel? Yes. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we have a beginning. Uh, just, uh, just now there is an Israeli minister visiting, there is uh, a TV journalist broadcasting from Saudi Arabia. Clearly, um, the Saudis decided to, to loosen, uh, either because they are preparing for the normalization or they are in a way building an alibi, saying, okay, the United States wanted so much, we've, uh, we've made an effort and for some reason, maybe it didn't work out. What do you mean by didn't work out? And it's very difficult for the United States and, uh, to, uh, to give the Saudis everything they want. And uh, you don't have to delude yourself. If you allow them to, to develop nuclear, uh, to enrich uranium in Saudi Arabia, quote unquote, for civilian purposes, you know very well that it could easily be converted into military uh, use. And uh, so that's problematic. The second is that uh, to give them a, a security pact or guarantee the way you gave to NATO countries or to Australia and New Zealand is also not very, not very easy. So the deal could blow up just on that. Now add to this the Israeli component. Um, they, will not, they will not do it without a Palestinian element. The Israeli government will have to make concessions to the Palestinians. How many concessions? How far do we have to go? I don't know yet. I mean, in the case of the Emirates, all they wanted was no annexation and that was relatively easy to give them. But uh, I don't know how far they will go. And you have uh, an Israeli government and a coalition government with uh, some very radical right-wing elements in it. I mean, the Smotrich, Ben Gvir and so forth, and inside the Likud, who do not want to give the Palestinians an inch. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, at the request of the administration, the Biden administration, the Israeli government wanted to, to give them uh, five uh, semi-armored cars for police use. And there was a commotion in, in, in Netanyahu's coalition. So if he has to, to give them, uh, to, to mention the word two-state solution, um, maybe to give them uh, some percentage of what we call Area C, uh, no settle, no new settlement construction, you know, whatever may be on the table, that may be too much for Netanyahu's government. So this could be the spoiler. So at this point, I wouldn't bet I, uh, either way, but it could end up as a major, major revolutionary step. I mean, uh, Saudi-Israeli peace and normalization could not be the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict because the Palestinian conflict remains with us, but will bring us very close to an end of the conflict. And we'd also have repercussions in the Islamic world. Saudi Arabia is a very important Muslim country and countries like Indonesia, Malaysia have no relations with us. 
now could have relations with us. So it could be a very important uh, turning point if it materializes. So one doesn't hear a lot of discussion about a two-state solution these days. Um, are there, uh, what, what does Israel-Palestinian uh, negotiation or, or uh, uh, peacemaking, are, are there interim steps? Are there interim issues that, um, that are on the table or at yeah. least from Washington's perspective? Yes, there could be an, uh, what you call an interim agreement is, is definitely conceivable. And I know of several uh, plans for such an agreement that have been prepared in think tanks and maybe inside the government. But you need a government that wants it. Now, remember, um, Smotrich and Bankby are part of the coalition. They, it's not that they don't want a two-state solution. They want to annex the West Bank. And, you know, openly so. If if any if you or any of our listeners will Google uh, Bezalel Smotrich's uh, decision plan of 2017, you will read in five or seven pages his uh, vision for annexing the West Bank to Israel in a way creating a one-state uh, situation. Uh, so this is not the kind of government or kind of coalition that will make concessions to the Palestinians. Now you could say in theory, Netanyahu could would make a huge decision and decide, okay, I'm actually uh, willing to give up this coalition, risk my uh, position as prime minister, make the deal, then go for elections and maybe be re-elected by an Israeli public fully enthused by, by this. He, I doubt that he's such a risk taker. He very much wants to be safely in his position as prime minister. Why do you describe, why do you use the, uh, the imagery of a maze for um, this current book and the, the period of time? Do you, do you see any, uh, is, it, is it an enclosed maze? Uh, are, there, are there any uh, uh, ways out uh, that, that, that you see in the metaphor? And it's a maze because it's a very complex uh, region composed of uh, many countries that are very different from from one another. Uh, now that we have uh, these normal relations with countries in the Gulf, and I go to the Gulf quite regularly, I see a part of the Middle East that is very different from the Levant, our part of the Middle East, from Egypt, uh, very orderly, very uh, prosperous, and so forth. You always have to remember that 90% of the, of the residents are not citizens. It's only 10% that are, are citizens. But they are prosperous, very sophisticated elite, very neat. It's one, but if, if you go to Libya, if you go to Egypt, if you go to Yemen, uh, uh, very different countries, each of them with, with its own problems. There are more than, it's about six countries in, in the Arab world that are what you call failed states. Uh, don't function as a state, uh, sovereignty is uh, nominal. Uh, this is not a healthy situation, so, uh, I mean, not that Europe nowadays presents a very attractive picture, but uh, uh, compared to that, what, what we see in the Middle East is what I call a maze. Um, before we get to uh, some, some uh, viewer questions that have come in, I wanna uh, encourage anyone uh, uh, who'd like from, from the live audience uh, to uh, share with us any questions with our, uh, our team here. Um, I am uh, curious, uh, we didn't really cover Syria yet, and, and given, um, I, I do want to give you some time first to, you know, take us back to uh, the historic moment when, when you were uh, there, and, and there, like, how close were we to having um, you know, some, something that could be sustaining with, with Syria, and how far are we from that today? Okay, so first of all, you know, you, you touched a soft spot for me. I mean, it's a, I don't tell you, I won't tell you it's a country I love, because I don't, it's not very lovable right now, but yeah, I invested many years in studying and researching Syria. It's a country I know very well, and I felt privileged when Prime Minister Rabin invited me to become the chief negotiator with uh, Syria. So the idea that 
the country that you studied, uh, you could be the peacemaker with was, was very attractive mm. to me. Um, and actually there was one moment that I, uh, I described in some of the books you mentioned before. At, uh, it was a very dramatic moment when Rabin gave Secretary of State Warren Christopher what we call a deposit in order to break the leg jump, uh, uh, the log jump with uh, Syria, Rabin gave him a deposit. He said, I'm depositing with you a hypothetical, theoretical, conditional willingness to withdraw from the Golan Heights in return for a peace package comparable to the one that we have with Egypt. And he said to him several times, it's in your pocket. It's in your pocket. Don't put it on the table. He did it in early August, 1993, when Oslo was very close to being signed. In my view that Rabino was not fully happy with Oslo, it was a way out of Oslo, would have preferred the Syria deal first. Unfortunately, Secretary Christopher did put it on the table. And it was the moment he put it on the table, Assad began to negotiate, I mean, to, to bargain. He was, yeah, the, the soup was invented in Damascus. And he said, if Rabin said withdrawal in five years, he said six months. If Rabin said normalization, he said, I don't like this word. It's uh, insulting and so forth and so forth. So when Christopher came back, Rabin understood that he had no partner at that point, And he went to Oslo a bit unwillingly. So that was the moment in which I think a deal could be made if, and here this was a case of the failure of the American uh, mediator uh, in, in, uh, in, that, uh, uh, in that case. Uh, later on, no, uh, we were never really close to a deal. And, you know, there was opposition inside, I mean, obviously in Israel, people who didn't want to give up the Golan Heights, who thought that bringing the Syrians back to Lake Tiberias was too risky. And in Syria, there were members of the regime who told Assad, you know, our legitimacy derives from the fact that we represent the uh, resistance to Israel. If we make peace with Israel, who would allow us to keep this army and these security apparatus? Or don't risk the very existence of the regime. So it was difficult on both sides. Well, um... I'm glad we touched on a soft spot because uh, it, it, it brings back um, lots of um, what ifs. Um, and and I, I, I'm, uh, I'll take one more before I go to some of the audience questions, but um, one of your books is about Yitzhak Rabin. Um, and I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, just again, from someone who has worked with uh, senior leadership on, on um, both political and diplomatic. Uh, uh, what, what do you miss most from Rabin's uh, 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 period of, of peacemaking? Um, and is, is there a prospect that there will be an Israeli leader uh, who will make that sort of a, um, a, a central part of their, their focus of, 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 you know, their leadership in the future. Rabin was unique and working with him was really uh, a, a wonderful uh, experience and, and a privilege I, I had. Um, he was very smart and uh, people spoke about him as the analytical mind. He was very analytical, very smart, a total recall. Uh, very honest, very open, straightforward. What you saw is, is what you got. This is what, you know, I, again, some of my most interesting minutes, um, hours actually, were spent in uh, meetings between uh, Rabin and Clinton. Uh, they call it one-on-one, -on -one, but one-on-one -on -one is always two-on-two -two because there has to be a note-taker <laughs> on, on both sides. And I, I was the Israeli note-taker, and, you know, these are rare moments. And... You could see, I mean, how they fell in love with one another. You know, for Clinton, Rabin was an older man. And for somebody who, you know, had a father complex, a military hero to somebody who did not do military service, a man who could make bold decisions and who could be fully trusted. And Rabin appreciated the warmth, the intelligence, the, the political skills, the concern for, for Israel. And they just liked each other. 
uh, enormously and, and, and did business uh, very well together. So um, uh, now, uh, uh, Rabin was unique in, 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 in that regard. I, I worked for him, you know, sometimes when you are a negotiator in a complex and delicate negotiations like the one with Syria, you need to know that behind your back, there is a prime minister who will keep your back. And I always knew that Rabin will be there. It was a, a very important policy. Um, so one of the dynamics of the, the, the Oslo period and the, the pre-Oslo period was um, very practical, functional um, collaboration with, with, with Jordan and um, uh, Palestinian Authority at the time uh, around things like uh, water and, and energy and, and um, education, of course, other, um, uh, one of our, our, our uh, uh, questions that we have from the audience is whether there is still, um, given challenges around energy and uh, Israel's high-tech uh, uh, work in this area, are there opportunities to sort of bypass the formal diplomatic realms uh, and, and build facts on the ground uh, that are needed uh, uh, for, for at least neighboring countries? No, the reality is that you cannot do, uh, you cannot so go into ventures without the, the government uh, support and agreement on, on both sides. For instance, the idea of what we call the uh, uh, dead red canal from the Dead Sea to the Red Sea. It was an idea that was floated some time and then the Jordanians lost interest and that was uh, the, the end of that or the idea of a joint airport for Elat and, and Aqaba. But we do have very important collaboration in energy and water. We, we desalinate water and we provide Jordan with water. That's very important and they can produce electricity in the south and provide us with uh, electricity. Uh, and now we sell them gas that, uh, that we produce offshore. So, and by the way, similar co collaboration with Egypt. So de facto, um, normalization here acquired uh, in, in a new dimension. Um, but Jordan at the same time is a state with a Palestinian majority. There is a great deal of, uh, let's say, uh, still hostility to Israel among many Jordanians. And there's always the issue of the, uh, 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 the, the holy places in, in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. Right? They are the keepers. They think that they, are the, they have a special position. And whenever Israelis uh, go up and pray or uh, sometimes break the rules, uh, there is sensitivity in, uh, in Jordan, let alone the prospect that a, a madman would set fire to the uh, to the Muslim uh, holy places or try to blow them up as some crazies in the Israeli in the Jewish underground wanted to do at some some point. So, you know, we it, it's uh, you know, walking on some some very precious ground. Uh, one of our our uh, audience members is asking about Lebanon and whether there is any trust with the current prime minister or any. Um, uh, any common interests uh, that that are uh, allowing for for you know some cooperation or or now you asked me before about uh, Gaza first and uh, say something about Lebanon second. <laughs> uh, it was a cliche in the fifties sixties that Lebanon would be the second Arab state to make peace with Israel. Mm -hmm. That they would wait for somebody to to be the first and then they would join in. Uh, essentially a Christian country, moderate, uh, with natural ties to, to Israel. Unfortunately, it's been totally reversed. Mm. It's now a country dominated yeah. by Hezbollah. Government is dominated by Hezbollah. And it's became a hostile country. So, uh, I, unfortunately, I'm, I can say that in many respects, Lebanon will be the last Arab country to make peace with Israel. So we, we were talking a little bit before um, we went on air about uh, uh, the UN week last week, and and obviously there are the 
public speeches and uh, 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 meetings that get reported in the media, but but also there's a lot of stuff that that happens, um, or at least uh, has happened in the past. What what for you are the big takeaways from from uh, the United Nations uh, uh, gathering last week as it relates to the Middle East? Not not much actually. Uh, Netanyahu's speech was given on a Friday after many actually left. It was given to basically an empty hall. Uh, it was not a, a speech given to the UN, it was a speech given to domestic audiences in, in Israel. It was broadcast live. And, 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 more, and it was overshadowed by the fact that President Biden, after evading Netanyahu for a, a long time since, uh, finally gave him a meeting. It was, uh, as I said before, President Biden decided that he needs Netanyahu for his Saudi deal. And he uh, uh, toned down his criticism off and pressure on Netanyahu. So they had a, what seemed like a good meeting and it, it, it seemed well, it did well for Netanyahu in, uh, in Israel. That, that was the, important moment of, uh, of that UN week. And the fact that, uh, let's say, the head of China and the head of Russia were not there. Um, someone from the audience asked about, uh, uh, is there an opportunity at all with, with China? Um, and I don't think a lot of people realize that, that there are, uh, you know, Israeli universities that, that operate uh, in China, there are Chinese students that you will see at, at Technion and in Tel Aviv and, and, and elsewhere. Um, what, I mean, we can't ignore China, right? And your, no. your, your, your cautious tone earlier is, is well taken, obviously. We have a lot of concerns, but are there some opportunities there too? Yes, there are, but uh, the major obstacle is uh, US opposition. Uh, U.S. sees China as a rival. Uh, it, uh, it didn't, it resented the fact that we gave them a, a port facility to build a port in, in Israel, and uh, that they bought some important uh, food uh, companies in Israel. Uh, uh, anything that looks like dual use, both military and civilian, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, uh, will object to our, to our trading with China. So that's a big constraint on our relationship with, uh, uh, with China. Um, of course, the US comes first and uh, that's a constraint. Uh, there's a question here about uh, uh, COVID in, in, in uh, the Arab world. Um, from, from your uh, perspective, the health issues assign, uh, aside, um, did you see any either disruption or uh, uh, change in the society and what, you know, like different countries adapted in different ways uh, uh, to the challenge. Um, how did the, the Arab countries, if we could speak of them collectively or the Middle Eastern countries, how did they do um, in dealing with that challenge? And, or was it a blip in terms of, you know, their, their own internal processes? It varied according to the quality of government and administration in any of them. And not surprisingly, the Gulf countries were very efficient in dealing with uh, COVID and uh, uh, Egypt and Syria were, uh, were less so. Um, no, it, you know, the, unfortunately, the population has limited expectations from mm. their governments. Mm. And so there were another grievance in the countries. I mean, ultimately, you know, vaccination arrived and the issue was dealt with, but it took, it took time and probably too many uh, casualties. So it added a grievance, but uh, not much more than that. Well, low expectations is not a problem in Israel. Uh, uh, what do you think, um, without getting into the politics of it, what do you think um, from this round of discontent that is being expressed so openly uh, in Israel on a regular basis by a, by a large portion of, 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 of the populace. Um, are there some silver, are there silver linings here that, that you see in terms of, 
you know, we've talked about the, the or you made reference to the, the vibrancy of civil society in Israel and uh, people from different sectors uh, that, that are um, becoming civically engaged. Um, um, are there civil linings here? Will this lead to um, a, a more organized reckoning of some of Israel's differences that have been sort of, you know, pushed down the road? Yeah, you know, uh, sometimes when, when I go, I, I go practically every Saturday night to the big demonstration in Tel Aviv, and my thought is, uh, where were you on election day? when many Israelis went abroad or went to the beach uh, of the people who now demonstrate, because the election was decided by a very small margin. Um, so uh, Israeli civil society has been mobilized and it's not going to go away. I'm, I'm really not looking at it in, uh, right now in political terms, but in, in terms of the welfare of the society. It's good that people are, are mobilized, that they're not you know, sort of self-centered uh, busy just in thinking about career and making money, but have larger goals and aims in uh, in mind. And it, it's impressive to see how many people volunteer, keep keep at it. And I'm sure that at some point there will be a compromise. I mean, this could not go on endlessly. At some point there will be a compromise and life will go back to normal in that regard. But I believe that uh, a significant element of the people who had been mobilized for the protests will remain active in, in civil and civic life. That's a very good uh, development. Would it, could you envision a constitutional convention or, or, or it may take some other form? Not, uh, no, not a full, you know, uh, of course, many, many complained that Ben Gurion made a big mistake that when he did not draft the constitution, in the first days of the state, he decided that given the religious issue and the issue with Arabs, it was too complicated and he left it uh, for another time. That was a mistake. Uh, I don't think we, it's feasible now, but what can be done and needs to be done is the one, uh, one important law uh, regulating uh, the issue of uh, uh, the justice system. For instance, uh, you know, much of the debate to the extent that you followed it has to do with the issue of basic laws. What is a basic law in Israel today? It's just a law that is passed in the Knesset and uh, they add to this the, the term, this is a basic law. You know, it's meaningless, except that it's called a basic law. There has to be a, a, a stipulation that will say a basic law is a law that governs a major issue in the life of the state, it has to be passed by a majority of 70, 80, or whatever, out of the 120, can only be changed by a majority and so and so many. And then it has the, the validity of a basic law. And then the idea, as it crystallized in the 50s and, and then on, was that instead of drafting a constitution, we should just uh, pass a series of basic laws that together would form sort of a constitution. And I think that is feasible, too. but uh, we're not there yet. Uh, one of our, our viewers is asking about, um, in the context of the, the uh, potential route to uh, Saudi normalization, about the concessions that Israel is being asked uh, to make as part of that deal. Our, our questioner wants to know, are the Palestinian, will the Palestinians have concessions um, that they will have to make in some kind of reciprocal way in order uh, to, to advance uh, the, this Saudi, Saudi path, let's say? Yeah, yeah. For instance, uh, uh, they, they will have to, to accept uh, something that they actually committed to in Oslo, that's to, to fight terror vigorously. Uh, to stop incitement, uh, to clean their textbooks from anti-Israeli rhetoric. Yes, definitely, a two-way street. Um, Ambassador Rabinovich, I, uh, we, we've spent um, a lot of time on, uh, uh, on book number 12, but give us a sneak preview of book number 13. 
Lucky book, number, yeah. book, uh, book number 13 will deal with the relationship between the state of Israel and its Arab citizens. It's almost 2 million uh, citizens of Israel are Arab. And what we used to call Israeli Arabs, now they want to be called Israeli Palestinians. Uh, about 80% of them, I think, are interested in finding a modus vivendi with the state. About 20% remain hostile to the, to the state. The state has not done uh, its utmost to reach out to them. And um, um, they are undergoing important changes. You know, when, when the state was founded, there were about 150,000 Arabs, most of them villagers, the elite left. They were very weak, frightened, divided. Now it's almost 2 million, and they are becoming more and more prosperous, more and more educated. They are forced to reckon with in in Israel, and the state of Israel needs to find a formula for living with this minority. And uh, I'm going to end with a, uh, I don't know, I hope, it, I hope you view it as a soft question, but, but uh, maybe it's not. Um, if there's a book 14, and you got to choose the book you really wanted to write after your illustrious career, what, what would be the book you would love to write, forget the publisher, forget the audience. What's the book you would love to write that you haven't been able to write yet? Well, I, the, the first and only biography I, I wrote was of uh, Rabin in the series Jewish Lives that Yale Press is publishing. I expressed an interest in writing the biography of Menachem Begin, mm. uh, fascinated by his personality. I grew up in, my, my late father was a, uh, his, one of his supporters, I was not, mm. but uh, his, uh, his transformation when he became prime minister was always intriguing, and that's a book I, I wanted to write. I was told by the series that uh, no author is allowed to write more than one book in the series, so I, I abandoned it at that point, but this could be book number 14. Wow, all right. Well. You don't have to, or to the audience, you don't have to wait around. Uh, read book number 12 now. It's out in print. We've got a, a code and everything so you can gain access to it. Uh, uh, we're excited. Uh, P Professor Avinovich, I still have to call you uh, President Avinovich. I, I didn't know what actually, I, you know, when we first started preparing for this, what title to use because you've held many, but uh, certainly for today's episode, um, you were so gracious in sharing with us uh, your candid views on both personalities and uh, developments uh, in the Middle East, which you followed over your entire career. We're grateful for that opportunity at the American Israel Friendship League. You have exemplified uh, the building on the common values uh, between the United States uh, and Israel in so many different ways on the academic front, on the diplomatic front. And uh, uh, we're, we're grateful to have your, your insights and your uh, wisdom and, and, and perspective on both history and, and current events and even a peek into the future a little bit. I think that for, for me, gives us great hope um, as we uh, uh, recognize that, that, that uh, not all our developments get to happen as quickly as we want, certainly not in the Middle East by uh, um, the, the uh, Western patient standard, but but we'll try to be a little bit more patient maybe this year, and uh, um, and, and 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 continue to look for uh, new developments. In the meantime, some of the best chefs in the world happen to come from Israel. So if you're looking for uh, something really great uh, to make uh, with a little bit of an Israeli flavor, next week we are focused on the pomegranate. So uh, October 1st on, on Sunday, come visit with us and learn how to make some great dishes with uh, Chef Nir Zuk in uh, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, doing some really great uh, creative things uh, with the pomegranate. We're looking forward to that. We're also looking forward, save your date, November 27th, Pierre Hotel in New York for our annual uh, uh, Partners for Democracy dinner. Uh, we're honoring uh, a great institution, Israel, Israel Democracy Institute and Yochanan Plesner, uh, uh, as long as, as well as uh, the head of the Marcus Foundation and co-founder of, of uh, Home Depot, uh, Bernie Marcus. Uh, it'll be a great opportunity to bring together and celebrate democracy in a way that this organization has been doing. 
for over 50 years and, and, and continues to uh, enjoy having uh, uh, people like yourselves show up week in, week out for the many different aspects of, of Israel that aren't always the focus of, uh, of the media or, or other attention. Uh, we're trying to do this in a, sort of a, a Hamish way and, and from uh, people's houses uh, to one another. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to um, uh, to share together. So thanks again, uh, 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 Ambassador Rabinovich. Shana Tova to everyone. Have a wonderful uh, holiday period for those of you continuing to celebrate the holidays. And we look forward to seeing you again on, uh, on Sunday. Thank you. It was great being with you, Frank. Thank you.